Hi everybody, I hope you can hear me today and welcome to our uh, webinar on evaluating the uh, potential of drug repurposing in COVID-19 and rare diseases. I hope everyone's doing all right in these extremely unprecedented circumstances that have ironically brought us together to discuss this subject today. So just to introduce who's in our room today, we've got me, I'm Philippa, I'm the project officer at Find a Cure if you've never seen me before. Hello everyone, and we've got Rick, who is the CEO of Find a Cure, and he'll be talking today about drug repurposing and rare diseases, and Dr. David Cavalla, who is the founder of New Medicus, and he will be talking to us about drug repurposing and COVID-19. It's just the simple schedule for today's webinar. Um, so we'll have the welcome from me. I'm just going to provide some context to what Find a Cure does and why we're running this webinar today. And then it'll be over to Rick to discuss what drug repurposing is and why it matters. And then we will go over to David to talk about how we can use drug repurposing to approach treatments for COVID-19. And then we'll be discussing drug repurposing in rare diseases. So just some background to find a cure and what we do. So we envision a world in which all rare diseases have treatments made together with patients for patients. So our kind of primary aims are collaborations and patient centered um, programs. So we're here to accelerate treatment development and care for rare disease patients. Um, and we, we can split our um, work into three broad categories. So we've got our empowerment programme, which works to empower patient groups to have confidence to, uh, to find their own treatments and to, to um, develop their own patient groups. And then we've got our promotion of repurposing for rare diseases. And all, all, all the time we're looking to build a rare disease community through events such, a, such as this and face to face events so that you can network and learn from each other and everyone can progress together. So the aims of today um, are basically to find out what drug repurposing is, so an overview of drug repurposing, um, why we can use it to approach COVID-19, and this has been in the news quite a lot, so hopefully we can provide some clarity on what's actually be, being, being done and uh, the kind of outcomes we can hope to see, and what are the parallels between COVID-19 and rare diseases, and what's currently happening, as I just said, it can be very confusing with all the news that's going around. So hopefully this will um, cut through some of that noise. And then what is happening to encourage repurposing for rare diseases? So we're going to cover some uh, projects that have already been done and projects that are underway. So we can see the kind of progress that's being made. I'm going to hand over to Rick and he's going to talk about what drug repurposing is. Um, on a more on a more base level, so we're all on the same page, and then he'll be back later to talk about drug repurposing and rare diseases. So, Rick, over to you. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you can all hear me okay, and fingers crossed, I've managed to get my screen share working so you can see my slides uh, in the proper view. All looking good. Okay, I'm going to assume that's positive. Brilliant. Um, thank you all for attending today and signing up to this webinar. We we thought it was an interesting opportunity just to. Talk a bit more about the work we've been repurposing and why it's so important for rare conditions, but also to highlight uh, this term, which is starting to be talked about quite frequently in the, in the new and, and unusual world we find ourselves in um, of, of COVID 19 isolation. Um, <clears throat> the schedule we've tried to put together uh, will hopefully work us through uh, right from the, the basic premise of repurposing and, and, and why we should think about this as an option, highlight how this is such a good strategy things like rare conditions and emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19, and then begin to dive into things in a bit more detail with David's presentation looking at COVID in detail, and then some more examples of what's been happening on the repurposing scene in rare diseases. And um, as I'm sure many of you will know, we, we've been trying to champion repurposing rare diseases for a while at Find a Cure, and, and really do think that rare diseases are driving a lot of fantastic work in this area. So I'm going to dive into my presentation uh, pretty much straight away for you all um, and, and answer that very first fundamental question, which hopefully based on the poll, everyone knows the answer to. Uh, and that is what is drug repurposing? Um, and that is most basic fundamental level drug repurposing can just be right, really likened to recycling. It's, it's the act of taking a drug that's intended to treat one group of patients or one condition and trying to demonstrate it can be effective and useful in a completely different group of patients. And, and ideally, in, in the best scenario, we want that evidence to be generated in a, in a meaningful way, in a, in a scientific way, through clinical trials. So trying to run trials to show that a drug that works in a completely random condition can work in a completely different condition at the same time. And that's the principle we're trying to use and talk about in today's webinar. 
when we're looking at drug repurposing, it's easy to forget that there are many different types of drug targets we can use, different approaches we can use uh, to find drugs that could be suitable for repurposing. The, the probably biggest pool that we can target is that large pool of existing generic drugs. So these are drugs that are widely available on the market, that are produced by multiple different manufacturers, are often low cost, and that's primarily because they're no longer uh, actively on the patent. Uh, so they can produce quite widely. And there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge about many of these drugs um, because they've been used for a long period of time in lots of different conditions and by lots of different types of people. We can then look at two other groups, uh, which I've labelled here in pink, uh, and I would generally term projects looking at these as repositioning rather than repurposing, but the terminology is exceptionally varied and broad across different areas. Um, in these groups, we're looking actually at a compound which has still some intellectual property active, it's still under some form of patent. And the first of those are current branded compounds. So these will be available on the market for a specific condition, uh, but they'll still just be produced by a, a, a single company. Um, there's a wealth of these and they are another uh, ideal opportunity for repurposing and particularly of interest to those companies themselves for repurposing because they could help them to extend the life of, of that drug for the company. The second the pool to look at within this bracket is, is shelved compounds. So these are chemicals or drugs that have been developed part of the way through the drug development process. Uh, but for some reason, that development never reached um, the market. It, it may well be that it didn't prove to be as effective as was hoped in the original condition they were developed for, in which case they may be shelved. But equally, they may have proved to be very effective in that condition, but they just didn't see a, a viable business model to move it forward. And these, these compounds end up sitting on, on shelves uh, in, in pharmaceutical drug libraries and, and not reaching market. And there's a, there's a wealth of interesting compounds there that could have great potential in our repurposing. So when we talk about repurposing, the thing that we often comes up is it doesn't sound super exciting. It has a bit of an image problem, unfortunately. The world we live in, these are the type of things that tend to be uh, of most exciting uh, course, if you like, within healthcare and, and scientific development. Uh, we tend to think about de novo drug discovery, the development, the production of a completely new compound as the big exciting thing. Um, this is exciting science, it generates papers, it's, it's sexy if you like. Um, it's also long, it's like time consuming. Um, genomics obviously is something that grabs huge amounts of the headlines, many papers, um, because it's really revolutionised our understanding of the underlying human biology and, and how we're actually built the instructions that, that make us up. Like. And it's unlocked the world of personalised medicine, this potential to generate treatments that are the absolute specific mutation an individual has, rather than maybe a broad uh, medical term that might encompass a range of different uh, mutations. And, and down the line, um, the potential for, in some cases, realised gene therapies and, and potentially gene editing, actually going into the DNA itself, going into that genome and changing the code in some way to deliver um, uh, underlying change in, in the mutations that might be causing genetic disease. These are these are big, exciting types of developments, and, and people get excited by it. And, and recycling old drugs doesn't sound super exciting in comparison. And that's a shame because it's both an innovative way of doing things and, and a rather effective way of doing things, especially to deliver things more quickly to uh, patient testing. All of these things have in common, though, the fact that because they're exciting science, they involve science, they're probably quite expensive, they're quite time consuming and, and that can make them quite a, a long process to go through the development right from inception to the patient. So before we can kind of dig in in depth into how repurposing is beneficial and why we should look at it in this area, we do actually need to understand properly what the normal development process is. Uh, and as I've kind of highlighted already, it is a long and involved process. It can take many, many years, often in the region of 15 years or so for a drug to be uh, approved and, and tried for patients. There are cases that are quicker, but there are cases that are much longer as well. And this is a very crude schematic breaking down those major stages of the development process that, that any drug is going to have to go through. Uh, those are research and development. Um, so essentially, <clears throat> in this stage, we're, we're trying to look at the um, basic science that's required to understand the condition itself and the basic science required to either identify a drug that could be used in that. Um, so generally in this phase, it can include some really early stage science. So you were looking into identifying maybe targets you're going to drug in your condition, so a druggable target, the basic understanding of the history of the condition potentially as well. 
but you may also need to come up with a completely new chemical that can target that bug of the target and then have that impact on your condition. So it's creating compounds to work within your target. To do this, you're going to screen potentially tens of thousands of different compounds to find one that can work effectively. And knowing it's effective isn't enough. You also have to understand its uh, behavior within the human body or animal body um, and the potential safety and risks of, of using that compound as a drug itself. And these are all things that are going to happen at this early R&D stage. As we move into stage two, we're starting to look at preclinical studies. So this is all about taking that concept you have from your, your early research and development, and beginning to test it in systems, in model systems, to see actually, well, is this drug, is this compound going to be effective based on the systems that we have available, but not yet looking at it in humans. So it's looking at running chemical models of our condition to see if the, the basic biochemistry can be implemented effectively, looking at then moving into cell models or then animal models of the condition itself to see if you can generate that evidence of effect or efficacy within that system itself. And it's not just about looking at efficacy again, but also the safety and tolerability, the toxicity of the drug you're looking at. And whenever you're creating that new chemical entity, that, that, that first time it's been used in people, there is a specific set of standards that you need to reach before you can use it in humans. And that's going to involve more prolonged and involved preclinical research. The third stage is the stage we all think about in drug development that is clinical trials. It's actually testing a drug within people, within patients themselves to see what the impact is. And this again can be quite a long and prolonged process. And this is because there are multiple different stages or subtypes of clinical trials. Uh, so the first stage uh, is gonna be a phase one trial and these are generally quite small trials that are geared towards looking at the tolerability and safety of the drug. So how much uh, of a certain dose is tolerable within patients? Uh, what is the outcome of giving humans this drug for the first time, for example, and what are the potential side effects for identifying. As you move through the clinical trial process, what we're seeing is a, a gradual increase in uh, focus on the efficacy, uh, so the outcome, the impact of the drug on your specific condition, and a growth in size of the trial as well, so begin to work through and add in more patients. So phase two trial, we'll still be looking often at dosing, uh, often to some degree at early stage indicators of efficacy, and also potential side effects as well. When you move to stage three or phase three, we're looking at a much larger clinical trial, which is really geared towards generating that evidence of efficacy within your condition and looking at a broad cross-section of your, your target patient population. And in some cases, you may also then go on to a phase four study, which may or may not come uh, pre or post approval. The final kind of stage of that drug development process um, is our review and approval. And essentially at this stage, we've hopefully had a successful clinical trial generated evidence to show it can be both safe and efficacious within our favorite condition that we're trying to treat. We need to take that evidence in a package to the regulators and ask them to give us a license to be able to sell it, to market it, uh, to treat that drug, uh, that condition using the drug. Uh, from that point, you then need to go through reimbursement. So trying to secure um, approval for governments or payers to actually buy this drug and prescribe it to patients. So this process can be really quite involved. And there are multiple different types of challenges and, and studies that have to be conducted within that whole drug development process. With repurposing, the advantages all come from the fact that we're trying to work with something that we know. Because we're working with a drug that we know, we can potentially speed up this process, we can make it faster. And by removing certain stages, we also reduce the cost, the financial cost, so we can be faster and cheaper to work with. And, and at Find a Cure, I've said many times, we think this makes it better um, for rare diseases uh, and a nicer strategy for rare diseases. The first thing that really reduces the speed, uh, increases the speed rather, and reduces the cost is the removal of uh, novo drug discovery, because you're not trying in this scenario to identify a completely new chemical entity. You remove a very prolonged, expensive, and um, time-consuming part of the process, uh, a technically challenging part as well. So this really does speed up the process of drug development. When you're working with a drug that you know about, there are clearly known safety profiles for that drug, and you know about its side effects as well. If that drug has a decent history of human use, so is available and licensed currently, or ideally generic, you'll have seen it used in loads of different types of human populations, different patient populations, different ages. And that gives you a wealth of, of knowledge to understand the potential side effects and outcomes of the condition, and really the safety of using that drug over a prolonged period of time. And what this can mean is you can use this existing evidence to reduce the need for some of those early stage clinical trials we just talked about. 
so we can strip back some of the phase one or uh, phase one studies to move more quickly into efficacy based or efficacy focused studies potentially with our repurposing. With repurposing, we also know something about, something about the pathways of action of the drug that we're working with. Um, and this can really help with identifying the candidate for drug repurposing. So rather than screening tens of thousands of drugs without any basic knowledge, um, <clears throat> if you like, about what that drug does, we can pick on those drugs that target the pathway that's most relevant to our favourite condition. And this means we have ideas for a group of person candidates. We screen a much smaller number, that's much quicker and much cheaper, and therefore we more quickly move to that clinical stage. So if we go back to our schematic, um, which shows us that repurposing pathway or drug development pathway, in a repurposing project, all of these stages still need to happen to some degree, but we can remove things, we can streamline things within each of these sections, and those are primarily tied around what we're doing, essentially. Um, if we're looking at stage one, the research and development, we, we're not developing a new chemical compound, so we don't have to go through all the prolonged things there. We can screen for our drugs and our candidates based on the known behaviour of this and another itself, and this really speeds things up. Much of the preclinical work about the condition itself still needs to be done to understand the underlying condition, but once we have that, we can move forward swiftly. In the preclinical studies, um, because we know something about the safety profile of the drug, we don't have to go through that, that hurdle of, of making sure we can prove it's okay to use in humans it's been used in humans. And this again can speed things up quite nicely in this stage. And in particular, at the clinical trial stage, we can use that existing body of evidence uh, about how the drug reacts in people to either supplement or reduce the need for some of the early stage safety focused clinical trials that can really streamline that process very effectively. And all of this accelerates the pace in a repurposing program of getting to the point where you can begin to put that drug into patients and begin to see what its impact within humans is. You still need to do the, the good work to get to that stage, but that can be quicker. And most crucially, when you get there, in repurposing, we aren't necessarily doing anything to streamline the process from there. You still need to generate the evidence really clearly to show it's efficacious, to show it's effective in your condition. You still need to do that effectively to secure the approval, but you get to that stage at an earlier point. So what that broadly means then is repurposing can save time at the early stages of drug development, which helps us get the patients. And that's what we want to really do. So it allows you to test the impact of a drug on a condition quite quickly. Um, and that makes it a really interesting approach when three certain types of scenarios come about. Um, when there's a really high unmet need in a patient population, you know, to speed the process up to reaching those patients is going to make things more effective. If there's an urgent need for treatment, those patients don't have much hope of, of another treatment or in a really dire situation that needs a quick response and trying to get that drug into patients more quickly it's probably going to make um, things more easily it makes repurposing a really valid approach and also if resources to deliver a treatment to research a new treatment are limited then repurposing again can help things it's going to allow you to more quickly and more cheaply get to the study now, for all of these reasons, this find a cure is interested and has been interested in repurposing for a while, because essentially we think all of these criteria do apply in rare genetic conditions. So if we look at the general picture of rare diseases in the rare space, we can see that there, there is clearly a huge unmet need in this area. So rare diseases affect about three and a half million people in the UK, about 350 million people worldwide, which is a really big chunk of the global community. A huge proportion of those are affecting children, so early in life, and, and a, a large chunk of those children are unfortunately passing away uh, before their fifth birthday. It's about 30%. So there's a real unmet need there and an urgency in those conditions for those patients. But what we do see pretty uniformly is a really low level of attention and research and actual treatment for rare conditions. So it's estimated that only around 400 um, uh, licensed treatments are available for the 7,000 or so rare conditions out there. So there's, there's a real need for something different happening in this area. And that is why we think repurposing is so effective there. Um, <clears throat> rare diseases are clearly a really challenging area to work in. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very challenging for a number of different reasons. Um, firstly, you just have a small number of researchers or clinicians working on, on any given rare condition. You have naturally a small and fragmented patient population. Patients are all over the place and that can make it very hard to identify them, very hard to find them to do the research that you need to do to develop treatments. 
Um, there's a limited understanding of disease natural history as a consequence of that, and, and often many rare conditions are quite varied in how they present across different people. Um, there's a limited knowledge of disease pathways and mechanisms, um, and there are no existing treatments, and, and often there's not a clinical care pathway in place. So this isn't an easy space to try and do drug development in big for all these reasons. Um, with that challenge in place, it makes a lot of sense to also try and reduce some of the unknowns on the other side of the equation. If you have unknowns in your patient population and your disease prognosis, but there's that need to generate some kind of treatment, try and work with a drug that you have a lot of knowledge about. Try and work with something where there is a lot of known information. Try and repurpose a drug because it makes it somewhat easier for you to move things forward effectively and more quickly to treat that on that number of patients. And again, that's another reason why repurposing fits well. In the rare disease space. Now this is where the parallel with, with COVID-19 and our current situation we find ourselves in becomes more apparent um, because the challenge of COVID-19 is very similar in many ways in lots of these criteria to the challenge of rare diseases. When working to treat an emerging infectious disease the situation is also naturally very challenging and, and in general uh, with that emerging infection initially the situation is very similar if not potentially even more tough than in a rare genetic condition, because obviously there will be a small number of researchers or clinicians that are working on anything like that disease, let alone that specific disease itself. It's just a feeling. So the, the basic innate knowledge we have at the start is going to be very low. Initially, as well, there's a small patient population, and, and many of them may be hard to identify, and we are seeing that even now with the numbers of COVID infections we're recording. Um, there's there's a huge swathe of people that are very low symptoms or, or asymptomatic that are helping to spread the condition and we don't really fully understand where all those patients are and how to identify them early to understand that full disease progression so really we're, we're often looking at the most severe cases which again are much lower clearly as i've just indicated there's that limited understanding of disease and natural history we don't really know how it progresses and it takes a while to build that knowledge up there's a limited knowledge of disease pathways and mechanisms as well. This might vary from condition to condition, but fundamentally understanding the full biology of the disease isn't always um, right there. Um, there are clearly no existing treatments. There, you might get lucky and have certain treatments that can be delivered there, but initially you don't know what those are. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's clearly no real clinical care pathway in place as well. That's something that's going to evolve quickly and develop as we move forward with the program. And fundamentally, and particularly pertinent to COVID in, in this case, is that there's no immunity in the population. So the likelihood of an emerging infectious disease uh, spreading quite rapidly is, is very high, and this creates that urgency, and that means something quite different and quite quickly. So if we dive then into some of the numbers and the figures around COVID, this is taken from a, a uh, an information pack that's shared by the Ethical Medicines Group uh, here in the UK, um, summarising some of the stats that have been collected together around COVID. This is these are figures taken from a few days back, so the transition from the 5th to the 6th of April, so I think the weekend into Monday. You can see there's that, that rapid change in numbers and development within the condition. We're seeing global cases rising at quite a high rate, new cases appearing, and, and the death toll obviously stacking up uh, day on day. In, in an alarming way and, and that is again reflected if we look at these line plots looking at the situation in, in emerging in, in confirmed cases uh, cumulatively uh, across top six countries in the EU plus Turkey you can see those trajectories um, are quite alarming at times to see that general growth and I think that that there really highlights the fundamental difference I suppose um, in the two comparisons we're looking at here rare disease front to the COVID-19 infectious from need and urgency there, are, there really are huge similarities <clears throat> between the situation for rare disease and COVID-19, and hopefully I've outlined to you. There is a clearly a really high unmet need, uh, and we need treatments to change the long-term prognosis of patients in, in both situations. And, and to the patients with both COVID and especially to rare conditions, the need is urgent for new treatment, the need to deliver something that can make a difference to their lives. Um, however, I suppose if we're bringing more brutal looking at that kind of uh, public health perspective angle on it, um, with rare genetic conditions, those low patient numbers and the chronic nature of the condition um, combined to some degree with that generational transmission, the fact that we don't are non infectious, they're passed on through the generations, means that there's a societally a lack of urgency 
that are generating new treatments for these rare conditions. And this is why we see, um, to some degree, the stats that we're seeing of 7,000 conditions with a limited number of treatments. And that's clearly something that the rare disease community wants to see change rapidly. In contrast, obviously, um, with COVID-19, we're seeing a really rapid spread of the condition and a universal threat. Uh, and that means there is that urgent need from society and a public health need, clearly, which is indisputable, to drive treatment into COVID-19. And it's for that reason that we're beginning to see this focus on repurposing. And the term repurposing is appearing more in the news that's associated with COVID-19, raising awareness about this as an approach for drug development. Um, we're seeing uh, urgently driving a rapid focus of scientific effort to treat COVID and, and repurposing provides a pathway to streamline the drug development process and to more quickly, hopefully, get treatments into a point where they can be tested in patients. We still therefore need to see good clinical trial design and, and good data collect to show that the drugs we are using are having a benefit in the patients themselves and that will always remain a challenge. But repurposing gives us that potential to find something that could help many of those patients that are in that respiratory uh, shock and, and struggling. So some of the stories that we are seeing across the COVID space um, the World Health Organization obviously has launched a global mega trial um, of the four most promising coronavirus treatments. And this is a really big international cooperative effort, um, highlighting what can be achieved in a very short time with that real emergency arising through both repurposing and scientific collaboration. And then looking at drugs um, in combination that have been used against HIV, so viruses, malarias, uh, and Ebola, all you know conditions that you can see some type of logic. Um, uh, for the potential applied treatment there. We're also seeing companies uh, like Helix and Farnex both using some of their, their platforms or artificial intelligence approaches to try and identify um, meaningful combinations or potential drugs that could help in the fight against COVID-19. So there's real uh, move and focus from industry to move into this space and to try and help on that fight um, to, to alleviate this, this growing public health emergency. And finally, um, companies or charities like LifeArc, who, who have um, released funding and making it available for the development and testing of therapeutics to treat COVID-19. So LifeArc have made available, um, I think it just closed actually a 10 million pound fund uh, to help identify repurposed, potentially generic drugs that, that have the potential to treat and, and help in the fight against COVID. And we're seeing more and more of this type of work, more and more of this type of funding becoming available to drive uh, changes in this area. So, uh, in summary, um, repurposing, I would say, offers a quicker, cheaper and, and potentially collaborative route to development of effective treatments. Uh, and it really is an ideal route to rapidly address conditions that have that high unmet need. And this is a, one of the multiple commonalities that we can see between rare diseases and emerging infectious diseases um, like COVID-19. A huge unmet need from patients um, and both can therefore benefit from that repurposing approach to potentially more rapidly get treatments to the point where we can test them in, in patients and, and see the impact more swiftly. Um, and the emergence and, and rapid spread of COVID-19 around the globe is leading to a huge global research effort and um, repurposing projects do have a real chance of delivering a meaningful intervention to patients in, in a more timely manner than traditional routes might have, might have gone down. And that hopefully explains why we are seeing repurposing being talked about and why it's, it's reasonable to look at the parallels between COVID and rare conditions. Um, so thank you for your attention on that. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand on to uh, David Cavallo. Uh, so David is a founder of Numedicus. Um, he's a member of Finding Cure Scientific Advisory Board and has done a range of different work in repurposing for, for many years now. And has a, a, an excellent understanding of the field and has also been involved in a project that's been uh, moving towards searching for, for um, support for COVID patients. So I'm going to pass over a uh, presentation to David right now and uh, let him begin his part of the talk. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, as Rick said, I am the founder and CEO of New Medicus, which is a consultancy company focused on drug repurposing. It's a, an area I've worked in for a long while. Um, but today you notice that the, the title screen um, shows a different uh, affiliation and that'll become clear as I go through. Essentially, Exfostat is a small company with an interest in, um, in, in a drug that could be used in the treatment of COVID-19. 
So um, in the, uh, let's get started. Uh, the first point is some nomenclature, and um, many of you will have seen various references to coronavirus, to COVID-19, uh, even sometimes to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the difference between all these names is that coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 refer to the virus itself. Um, and uh, COVID-19 refers to the actual infection, the viral infection, which f first took hold in 2019. Um, so it is a viral infection, but the reason why people die of COVID-19 is because of a condition called ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is effectively like drowning. I call it like drowning from within. Uh, your lungs fill up with water, uh, and that impairs the ability of the lungs to efficiently uh, exchange oxygen or um, translocate oxygen into the blood. Um, and, and that common pathway is something which doesn't just af affect viral conditions, it also affects other things, as, as we'll see coming through this, this talk. Um, COVID-19 has various different degrees of severity, as we're now very familiar with, with the experiences of, uh, of our prime minister. Um, about 80% of people require no hospital treatment, but uh, of the 20% who do, about 6% enter into intensive care and about 3% die, um, very sadly. Those figures and proportions uh, aren't cast in stone and the numbers uh, are changing depending upon how widespread the testing regime is, how many asymptomatic uh, patients are identified as a more widespread uh, regime rather than uh, a narrower testing regime. Um, but the other point to mention is that although that figure may suggest that the, the chances of surviving uh, in intensive care are about 50%, um, even if you do survive it, the uh, the consequences for survivors of, of, of a period in the intensive care unit are very far from good. Um, about 50% of those who do survive are not economically active uh, two years after they have been discharged. There's a very, very high incidence of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health conditions. And there are other complications like kidney dialysis, which require extensive intervention over uh, longer periods of time. Now, because it's a viral condition, um, one obvious approach to repurposing is to look for other uh, antiviral drugs. And there are a number of them, um, uh, like the anti-HIV compounds uh, and, uh, and other compounds which have, if not a direct antiviral effect, have an, another antimicrobial effect. And we've obviously heard about things like chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. In general, um, the evidence for these things is quite limited, um, despite the fact that pol some politicians, notably Mr. Trump, have advocated the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, and chloroquine. The evidence is really only based on in vitro studies. The studies in the clinic have been poor quality and uh, and equivocal. Um, the work on, um, on on compounds like, sorry, I should say, um, despite that fact, uh, political intervention in the US has led to them being approved at the, uh, by the FDA. Uh, in my opinion, that's a terrible uh, result because it uh, gives people a false impression of what regulatory approval really, really means. Um, there's a drug called favipiravir, which is a Japanese um, broad spectrum antiviral, which has been studied in an open label clinical trial. Um, that has also been approved in Japan. But again, the standard of data which underpins that approval is far uh, weaker than would normally be expected. Um, lopinavir ritonavir is a combination of drugs which is marketed for the treatment of HIV. Um, and they are used off-label. Um, they're not approved for 
for COVID-19, but they have been used in patients. Uh, and the po I suppose the most robust data is being generated for a drug called remdesivir, which is another broad spectrum antiviral drug, which was partly developed for another viral condition by Gilead uh, and then abandoned. So in, in summary, what I'd say is that there's no, what I would call proper trial evidence. What I mean by proper is a randomized, double-blind, controlled trial. Um, there's still uncertainty with regarding these drugs as what, uh, when to use them. Should they be used at the beginning of the of the condition uh, before the, the, the condition becomes very serious? Uh, what dose should be used? Um, given the fact these are repurposed drugs, there's no surety that they will be uh, effective for COVID-19 at the same dose that they were effective in their original viral condition. It's also worth comparing um, what level of, of efficacy we have typically seen with other drugs for flu-like conditions. I, I know that COVID-19 is not the flu, but um, it is caused by a, a virus with some similarities. Um, Tamiflu, if you remember, uh, is, is marketed by Roche for flu, so as an anti-flu drug, but there's been a lot of controversy about the level of uh, efficacy evidence. And last, but by no means least, uh, I talked about the use of lopinavir and ritonavir. Um, that is uh, uh, obviously a combination used in HIV, and combinations are often used in viral conditions because resistance develops. And this is going to be a significant problem for COVID because, um, as you can see on this slide, the I don't know whether my mouse works, but the uh, COVID or uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-strand RNA virus, and if you look on the top graph there, uh, in in yellow. Uh, RNA viruses mutate faster than almost any other virus. Um, and that's a consequence both of the small size of the genome and also the fact that they only have a single strand. And if you don't have two strands, there's no check uh, for what, when you have nucleotide um, elongation or uh, gen gen genomic elongation, you have no check for whether or not you've got a mutated base being put in or a normal base. So mutation will become a, a serious problem. Indeed, in the transfer from the bat to human, humans, it's estimated that uh, the coronavirus mutated over 260 times. So I'd like to now move on to ARDS because as, as we know, this is the reason why people actually die of, of coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, it's a condition which doesn't just arise from this particular virus, but also there's, it arises from other infectious conditions, from viruses or from sepsis, uh, also from trauma, um, things like blast injury or smoke inhalation or, or, or other kind of physical injury. And it has a very high rate of fatality. About half of people, maybe a little bit less, in some cases, die. Um, and as I've mentioned before, there's long-term health problems in survivors. Um, it, despite that, it is nevertheless an orphan condition. Um, about three to 400,000 patients in the Western world. Uh, and yet, even as an orphan condition, it kills more people annually than prostate or breast cancer. So perversely, the, the, the pandemic that we're currently face, facing has, has focused uh, attention on something which is a, a big killer in the Western world. And ARDS patients are treated in the intensive care units. The picture at the top of this slide shows um, what happens in a, in a COVID unit. Um, but if you take off the space suits that the, the nursing um, the healthcare staff are wearing, uh, you would have a similar quality and quantity of equipment in any other intensive care ward. And all you can really do is give supportive measures. Uh, you can ventilate uh, and you can give fluids. Now, ARDS has been a subject for repurposing 
uh, for, for some while. Um, but they, these approaches have not been successful. Um, because it's a, a, a highly inflammatory condition, one of the approaches that has been tried is the use of corticosteroids, which are obviously gold standard anti-inflammatory drugs. But one of the problems with them is that they also impair the ability of the body to combat infection. They are immunosuppressive. Um, and that has consequences in the treatment of viral infections or any other kind of infection that might be the, the basic cause for ARDS. And in this context, I would also note that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which I mentioned earlier on as uh, um, sort of antiviral approaches to the treatment of COVID-19, are also immunosuppressants. Hydroxychloroquine is indicated and labeled for use in the treatment of lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, and one concern I have about the use of these agents is that they also impair the ability of the body to fight the immune reaction that you need to combat COVID-19. Another approach, again, unsuccessful, is the use of beta agonists uh, and also statins. Um, and another approach which is still being investigated but uh, has had mixed results um, was the use of interferon beta, which was originally and still is used for multiple sclerosis. Um, and this bullet point highlights the importance of quality data because there was a uh, medium-sized phase two study, which was published in the Lancet in, I think, 2015, 2016. The headline uh, result of which was that there was a, quote, 81% reduction in 28-day mortality, which sounds a, an enormously high uh, and beneficial result from the administration of this drug. But it was an open label study. And one problem with open label studies is the selection of the patients. And if you select the uh, patients who you think might benefit, or alternatively, if the patients select themselves if they think they might benefit, then you can get a bias, an inclusion bias in in, uh, in the people who are included in your study. Uh, and that can give rise to a substantial uh, shift in the perceived efficacy of the drug. So despite the fact that this caused an 81% reduction in the phase two work, um, when it was progressed into phase three, there was no significant effect um, the work hasn't completely finished, but it, it, it'll it's it's going forward for a further trial because there was uh, there was a suggestion that there might be a subset of patients who um, who, who didn't take corticosteroids uh, who might benefit. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, well, the purpose for um, Exvastat was is it and is the development of a new approach based on repurposing for the treatment of ARDS. Uh, and obviously, therefore, it has applicability to uh, COVID-19 as well. Um, it's based on inhibition of vascular leak. So vascular leak is where you get fluid coming out of the vasculature around the lungs and going into the lungs and causing the edema which, uh, which, which is characteristic of ARDS. And it's a good story. Uh, it arose in about 10 years ago when a patient uh, who was thought to have pulmonary arterial hypertension was referred to a hospital center in Amsterdam. Um, and she, the uh, uh, possible treatments for PAH, she, tried, she was tried on them and they weren't effective. So they tried imatinib. Now, imatinib is a, I'll come on to exactly what it is, but basically it's an anti-cancer drug. Um, and it was being investigated off label as a PAH treatment at the time. Um, what they found surprisingly was that, firstly, the patient didn't have pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> she had something similar, but not exactly the same. And secondly, that the effect of imatinib was very, very rapid much more rapid than they thought and uh, or they expected. And they had, 
showed that the recovery was due to an improvement in the edema in the fluid within 24 hours. And then subsequently, a whole range of other case reports have arisen. Um, in total, there, are, there have been nine case reports in conditions similar to ARDS. And you can review all that literature at the uh, website, expostat.com forward slash technology. So as a result of the serendipitous finding and, and other case reports, it was suggested that uh, imatinib might have uh, a rapid anti-edemic effect in conditions like ARDS, um, and that's what Expostat was founded upon. So it was founded in 2016. Uh, there was an investment made by Cambridge Innovation Capital, and we're pursuing a virtual style drug development uh, uh, strategy. Uh, as I said, imatinib itself is a, is a drug used for the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia uh, and some other rare cancers. Um, in addition to the case reports, a whole series of pharmacological studies and genomic studies were conducted showing that it has, um, uh, that it works in a, via a different mechanism in ARDS from that involved in cancer. Um, the other point to make is that ARDS is uh, treated in the ICU, in the intensive care unit. Patients are unconscious. Um, they are intubated, they are unable to take oral medications, and they often have delayed or variable absorption from the gastrointestinal tract. And, and, that, um, and, and that means you really ought to deliver the drug intravenously rather than orally. And so we're, we're focusing on the intravenous route for our particular therapeutic approach. Um, this is just a, a schematic of what really goes on when, when fluid leaks from the vasculature. Uh, you can see um, in, that, in, in, in the image in the, on that slide how the endothelial cells which line the vasculature um, of the lung, uh, those cells part during an inflammatory process, allowing fluid to leak across. Uh, and that then goes into the air sacs, the alveoli, which are normally used for gas exchange. Um, and that edemic process impairs the ability of the blood to absorb oxygen, um, and it, it, it's implicated in the ultimate, uh, uh, ultimately fatal course of our pathophysiology. And what uh, imatinib does is it acts on the um, binding molecules, the proteins, which which actually uh, enable one endothelial cell to adhere to its neighbor. Um, and, the, and in so doing, uh, it, uh, impair the fluid leakage into the alveolar space. And it's a common pathway for, for almost, uh, well, for all forms of ARDS, regardless of whether it's caused by um, trauma or sepsis, or as we are uh, now focusing on, on COVID-19. And I'm going to go straight to COVID itself um, and focus a bit on what the course of the disease means for patients who are severely affected by it. Um, as I mentioned, 80 percent of patients recover outside the hospital. The ones who go into the hospital are categorized as, se as severe, um, but that when they do so, they are conscious and they are able to take oral medication. Uh, as we know, the major resource constraint, constraint for, for Western healthcare at the moment is the availability of ICU beds as well as ventilators and the nursing staff that are associated with intensive care. And if we can do what we can to restrict or delay that transition from when a patient is hospitalized and conscious, um, but outside the ICU, the transition from that stage to when they go into this ICU, when they uh, then become critical, they may need to be intubated, they are sedated. Um, if we can delay that or prevent it, it has massive implications, not just for mortality, but also for utilization of healthcare resources, which is critical in, in the current crisis, crisis that we face. And the other point to make is that unlike antiviral approaches, this is robust to mutations. It doesn't matter whether or not COVID 
uh, what form of COVID actually causes the condition, whether it's a mutated form or the or the first form that we've come across. Um, we we also have done a, quite a lot of work on uh, what we think is the right dose for treatment in uh, in this ARDS like condition, and we also know what the timing of the therapy should be. As I said, it should be given at that interface between hospitalized and ICU treatment. So we designed a program. Um, the first program is to, is to use uh, oral imatinib shown as counter COVID on the top left hand side of that slide uh, for the prevention of the transition from severe into critical. Um, but we're also still interested in the use of intravenous imatinib to reverse the ARDS that, that could develop in some patients. Um, and we are therefore manufacturing an intravenous formulation of imatinib uh, and intend to pursue that in a phase two trial uh, in ARDS patients. So the oral trial is underway. Um, that's, that was registered uh, with the Dutch medical authorities uh, a couple of, couple of weeks ago. Um, there's very large numbers of patients which they're seeing in Amsterdam as, a, as they are everywhere. And we're hopeful of being able to recruit uh, for this study in, a, in about two or three months and with an outcome expected a couple of months after that. And whilst we are comparing imatinib with, uh, with, with the antiviral approach, as I mentioned, antiviral drugs probably would need to be given um, in patients who are out of hospital uh, as a preventative for them getting into hospital. Imatinib orally, we intend to administer when they're in hospital, but before they get into intensive care. And the intravenous form of imatinib, which we call impentry, we anticipate that being given when they're intensive, in intensive care as a, as a, as a, way, a way of improve, improving the outcomes, the success outcomes and prevention of mortality. Uh, there's a team of people are working on this, not just me, um, working uh, on, so on the first three across there are uh, people associated with the UK side of the operations. And then uh, Yuri and Aman is the original inventor behind the technology. Uh, and um, he worked with uh, Marcus Schultz, uh, both of whom are in Amsterdam. Um, so as, as Rick said, uh, repurposing is a favored approach in, car, uh, in uh, COVID-19 and in ARDS therapy. Um, although the evidence is not yet available amongst antivirals to make good medical choices, uh, it's uncertain what is the best stage to administer, what's the best dose, and whether resistance could develop. Um, there have been various previous efforts in ARDS focused on the anti-inflammation, but in my view, there's a question mark about whether the anti-inflammatory effect of these compounds also impairs the ability of the host to fight infection. So the imatinib approach is based on just inhibition of vascular leak. It doesn't have anything, anything to do with the infection itself. Um, there's a strong rationale for its effect based on case reports, as well as in vitro and in vivo uh, pharmacological experiments. Uh, we're undertaking a trial using oral imatinib in severe COVID patients, and we uh, intend also to pursue an intravenous form for uh, an optimal treatment for ICU use. So that's all I really wanted to say about Exvastat. I thought, given you're here, uh, if we have five minutes, I can go through a, uh, a database that I've established over the past, well, quite a few years, actually. Um, and show you how it could be used to interrogate or how we can interrogate that database to find alternative approaches to repurposing in coronavirus treatment. So let me see if I can, yes. So this is, this is a database I set up some years ago. It, the URL is drugrepurposing.info. And, um, Go to the next slide. I'm going to do a live search for you for coronavirus. 
So the world is divided into mechanism, compound, and indications, and you click on one of these links. So we're interested in the coronavirus indication, and we can see how that connects to mechanism. So if I click on that link, uh, that uh, green oval, I get two options. Find a mechanism of action based on repurposing for a particular indication. So I want that bullet point or that radio button. And then if I get into the indication itself, I just type a few letters and come up with coronavirus. So it, it's, a, it's a fairly rare condition in terms of the number of approaches which have been tried. Uh, here are some of them. Um, you can click on the, uh, the title here uh, to go through to the actual under, underlying article. Um, you can also search for related conditions. So there's a variety of other viral conditions, cytomegalovirus and so on, Ebola, Cephalomyocarditis, Epstein Barr, Hantavirus, Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C. Uh, I won't go through all these now because we haven't got time, but just to show you how the graph display works. And um, so what I'm showing you here is. Uh, at the top in the blue square is the indication itself. That's coronavirus as, a, as an indication. Um, the purple hexagons are various compounds. The turquoise hexagon is, is, a, is also another compound from a different database. And the circles are mechanisms. Um, and, you, and, and the links between all the different classes are color coded depending upon what kind of information underpins it. So if I say wanted to know what the linkages are between coronavirus and chloroquine, I click on that green line. And this is the reference that comes up. It's uh, based on a, an in vitro experiment pharmacologically. Um, and this is the title. And if I click on the title, we open up another screen where the actual uh, uh, evidence is found. So if you if you want to look at this at your leisure, I won't go through all the evidence here, but uh, you can sign up for free. Um, uh, if people from this uh, webinar uh, would like a more detailed evaluation, get in contact with me and I will uh, upgrade your access so you can get um, premium access for it for a short period of time if you want to review the, uh, the evidence. So that's really all I had to say. Um, and I'd like to pass you back now to Rick. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it was fantastic, really in depth and, and great to see, you know, some overview of what's actually happening in the COVID space and also an in-depth analysis of a different approach. I thought it was quite a compelling and convincing uh, presentation, so thank you for that. I can see some great questions lined up. So I will try and dive in with just an overview of what's been happening in the repurposing the rare disease space to sum up the, the webinar today and make sure we've got some time for questions at the end. So this is just a slide that I presented midway through my, my previous talk, just highlight again that challenge of rare diseases and just to, to refocus everyone on what we are actually trying to tackle in rare conditions review and, and the, the obstacles we're up against when trying to move into that area of repurposing. I think the key difference I've kind of outlined already between repurposing for rare diseases come down to that unfortunate lack of urgency in trying to develop treatments in this space. 80% um, of rare diseases are genetic and we are seeing that generation to generation transmission rather than person to person short time frame transmission that means the spread is slow effectively and it's going to be less broad as well and rare diseases essentially are going to remain rare um, and that really unfortunately means that the consequences that the resources to deliver the treatments are limited uh, and the urgency to treat comes from those affected by the conditions whether they are themselves 
uh, patients or, or carers or family members of the condition. Um, so what we're generally seeing, therefore, in, in a drug and pill is a lot has been driven um, through patient group or academic-led innovation because that is a point where they are that much closer to the need. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of really exciting movement there. However, it is fair to say we are also seeing um, <clears throat> a number of projects now emerging from industry, and I will touch on a few different industry approaches to repurposing um, within rare diseases as well. Again, section. Um, but clearly, that, that patient-led innovation, that patient um, urgency, is driving things forward really effectively in this space and changing the way uh, people are approaching repurposing. Hopefully, I can show a few examples of that. Um, one of the really great examples that, that we're quite close to at Find a Cure is, of course. Um, the, the case of the AKU Society and nitisinone. Uh, so this is for the, the rare condition Alcaptinuria, or AKU, otherwise known as black bone disease. And it's affecting about uh, one in 150,000 people, maybe up to one in half a million people. And it's another inherited generic condition. Um, AKU is a progressive condition and it's caused by an error in a single enzyme in the body. Um, and this just leads to uh, an acid building up, it's no longer broken down. The acid unfortunately attacks the cartilages and the bones throughout life and, and that turns them black, which you can just about see in one of this um, joint replacement photo here. It also causes black spots to appear in the sclera of the eyes, the whites of the eyes, and also the ears to turn a kind of bluish tint. Um, also, you can see that the urine turns black uh, on the contact with oxygen. Um, the acid attack doesn't just turn the black, though it actually begins to degrade the bones. Uh, and so you get an early onset form of osteoarthritis. So these patients are probably okay early in life, but by the time they're reaching uh, early 20s, 30s, they're beginning to see a lot more joint pain and it leads to multiple replacements throughout life, which is very debilitating uh, in later life. Um, now what we've seen in our Captainuria is um, that the patient organisation, the Alcaptanuria Society, uh, have moved to try and uh, take things further forward through a repositioning approach, through taking an existing drug and moving it into their rare condition. Um, when they were, around the time they founded, when they were founded in, along with this, this gentleman here, Professor Ranganath, um, there was a failed trial for the drug nitisinone within the US. And the drug unfortunately failed due to the endpoint selection of the clinical trials. Um, the endpoint selected was to try and see an improvement in the range of motion within the hip joint of alcaptanura patients who are dosed with the drug nitisinone. Now the drug itself works on the same pathway as um, the production of homogenic acid. And essentially, if you are dosed with nitisinone, it should completely block the production of homogenic acid. Now, as this is the thing that causes all the problems, it's relatively obvious, from a biochemical perspective at least, that this should prevent further problems or further buildup of the acid. Of course, uh, in patients who've already got um, severely damaged hip joints or degraded bone, it's not so likely that there's gonna be a drastic improvement in the range of motion of patients who can dose with it because they're not necessarily being given a drug to heal that bone, they can be given a drug that stops further degradation. So the overall endpoint was limited to a single joint, a single range of motion, and aiming to see an improvement, which is always in line with the start. And unfortunately, they obviously didn't reach that endpoint in the trial. So the, the trial failed. Um, and this could have been the end of the story. <clears throat> it luckily wasn't. Um, the AKU Society here in the UK decided to try and move forward and see if they could have another stab at a trial for nitisinone for alcaptanuria. Um, so they, they began to fundraise uh, to, to focus their funding onto research to move things forward. The AKU Society were able to support the first human autopsy in alcaptanuria with the aim of better understanding the condition and all of its complexity, how it impacts the body in a whole range of different areas. And uh, they developed an AKU mouse model so to allow them to test the drug effectively in a, in a non-human model and really look at the biochemical endpoint. This condition. Um, they, they developed an AKU severity score, so it's a different endpoint for their clinical trial, and this allows them to better assess the disease progress across the whole body um, rather than just a single joint or a single range of motion. And that would include things like um, uh, problems with the heart valves, which are beginning more rigid, uh, as well as joint movement. Um, <clears throat> and through this work, they were then able to secure a specialist centre for the treatment and management of AKU based in Liverpool within the UK. Uh, and part of the mandate for this um, centre was to prescribe nitisinone off-label to English patients and, and a number of others as well. So essentially this is allowing them to begin to look at that, the impact of that drug within a, a clinical setting. 
Now, beyond that, they wanted to go further and generate that robust clinical evidence that David's been talking about. They were able to build an international consortium uh, to run a clinical trial um, that included actually in the consortium the patent holding pharmaceutical company and, and, and the CRO. So it's a really wide ranging collaboration that includes researchers, patient groups, and industry coming together to repurpose this drug for our platinuria. They secured FP7 EU funding to run a phase two and a phase three clinical trial to assess the efficacy of nitisinone in our capsinuria. And they also secured EMA advice in doing that. And the EMA actually suggested that the biomark evidence itself could be sufficient for approval, but they decided to go for a full clinical trial showing the patient relevant endpoints and outcomes as well. Now, despite the rarity of the condition, through having the patient group involvement, they were able to recruit a very large number of patients for the study. So over 140 patients for this condition uh, in the phase three study. Uh, and that really mostly excludes the English patients who are already receiving a drug off label. So it's a really impressive recruitment effort. And the trial was also completed early this year with, with really positive outcomes and data, which is currently being worked on and helping to prepare for regulatory submissions. So it's been a very long journey, but they are now at the stage where they are beginning to move to a point where this drug could be licensed and available to uh, AKU patients, uh, certainly around Europe and then hopefully around the world. Uh, and this is something driven through that kind of patient group driven innovation and taking a drug that was originally used to treat tyrosinemia type 1, a completely different rare condition, and moving it into their, their rare domain. So it shows the potential of this repurposing and the work that's been done through that different stakeholder driving, through that academic, clinical, patient group type of collaboration. It's a really fantastic case study. Another great example is the work being done by a US charity called Cures Within Reach. Um, and these, this, this is a charity that focuses pretty much exclusively now on drug repurposing. Uh, and they have a great case study around a condition called ALPS or autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. Um, and these patients suffer from enlarged lymph nodes and enlarged spleen, and they have increased infections and anemia. So essentially, these patients spend quite a long time each month in hospital from, from uh, severe situations, and many don't survive beyond that team. So we're talking five to ten days in hospital and, you know, high mortality rate at young age. This is a, a real case of high urgency, um, as well as a massive one that, that need. Now, just to really highlight the impact a single researcher can have, Cures and Reach found a researcher who just wanted to run a study of, of repurposed drugs to screen them in a mouse model of ALPS. Um, and he managed to find uh, a drug with potential efficacy through this study. So rather than leaving it there, Cures and Reach came back. Uh, they provided further some funding and support for a pilot clinical study within six patients. So again, it's highlighting that very rapid movement into that clinical setting. Now, this study was really quite successful. So within 90 days, five of the six patients in that early study were in complete remission. It's a very dramatic, profound outcome from a trial. Um, a very small trial, open label trial, more evidence that we needed. Uh, but it helped to move things forward in this area and provide a potential treatment for patients who didn't otherwise have one met that need. Um, the results were published in an open access journal with the idea to promote off-label use based on clinical knowledge and evidence and there's ongoing monitoring and treatment and treatment within literature essentially so more publications have done to show how effective this has been and cures and reach estimate this approach um, um, which uses a drug called sirolimus uh, a low generic cost is potentially saving around fifty thousand dollars per patient per year while also including in massively improving their, their health and quality of life so it's a really uh, nice example of what small levels of investment of research and one researcher's time can do in the rare disease space, um, finding the right drug at the right time, um, but still showing that there's work to be done to actually begin to develop that and move it towards that licensed position and move it to a place where access is even across the community. Another project that we're involved with at Find a Cure is, is called MCDS Therapy, and this is a nice example of an academic led repurposing project for an ultra rare condition, in this case, a bone condition. Um, so MCDS uh, is also known as metaphysical chondrodysplasia type Schmid, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, you'll agree, but it's essentially uh, a rare condition that leads to short stature, which isn't inherently a problem for patients at all. Uh, but we are seeing disproportionately short limbs, uh, bowing of the limbs as well. And it's this bowing and, and, and proportional shifts that cause problems with gait and also joint pain. And this can be a real problem for those patients, particularly later in life and, and, and affect their quality of life. 
Um, the disease itself is caused by a mutation in collagen 10. Um, and what's been found through quite extensive preclinical work is, is actually there is a pathway by which a simple generic drug, previously used in epilepsy, carbamazepine, has a potential to, to restore some of the bone growth within these patients and potentially limit some of that pain and bone malformations. Uh, They've been able to test it to show it in, in MCDS models in mice, and it's this evidence that's been used to, to drive forward and move MCDS therapy into the clinic, provide a clinical trial of a simple repurposed drug in these patients. Um, again, it's one of these really big international collaborative efforts. We can see a whole range of different stakeholders spreading across Europe, but also stretching out to Australia, most of these being academic institutions or clinical institutions. But we do have some involvement from industry and charity, find a in one representative, um, Psyomics, a, a biomarker company, another. But there is no um, traditional pharmaceutical or biotech company involved in this development. The partners have, however, been to the EMA to talk about their, their trial protocol and have the intent to try and find a way to deliver a low cost treatment for this ultra rare skeletal condition down the line. And then hopefully, this type of model where academics who traditionally actually focused on much of the preclinical work are moving that through into the clinical space and trying to reach patients. Hopefully this model is something we can pioneer and, and really drive to, to um, highlight as a, a way that we can deliver new treatments to patients more effectively and, and certainly bringing patient groups into that type of work would be something we'd love to see. Now as I mentioned it isn't just this academic or patient group driven route that we are seeing spread in the rare disease repurposing space but it is also industry moving this area because it has great potential for industry in the field of rare diseases. Um, it, it can allow these shelved assets I mentioned, mentioned earlier to be brought to, to the market for new conditions um, so it's, it's more efficiently using the resources and, and making sure there's less waste if you like of that primary research investment from industry. Um, it can give the companies themselves access to the orphan drug designation, which is something we haven't talked about much today, but this potentially can have a range of different benefits to that company and prolong their life of an existing uh, marketed drug. Uh, and I'll have an example of how that's happened uh, shortly. And it can also be a really great space in rare diseases for innovating new clinical trial design approaches uh, and delivering significant medical innovation and significant patient benefit, actually, which is fundamentally the core aim of many of the uh, that are working in this space, trying to meet that on that uh, and to do something new and innovative rather than more need to like products. And the opportunity to reformulate existing products, to change the way they're delivered, um, to change the dosage, to change the, the way they're, they're packaged and the chemical, and can actually make quite an effective business model for some of the smaller pharma companies or biotechs to begin to move into a generic drug repurposing space and unlock some of those opportunities to ensure that new treatments can move for rare disease patient groups. I've got two brief examples before we wrap up the session. Um, the first of those is the use of Everolimus for tubular sclerosis. Uh, and this is, a, again, one of those cases that began with um, fundamental research into the underlying mechanism of the rare condition. So tubular sclerosis uh, causes a range of different growths, many which are benign, but in the brain and the kidneys throughout the skin and have a, a range of different impacts on patients' lives. Um, and the, the Tubular Sclerosis Association, patient organisation, provided funding for basic research to try and understand what was causing the condition. Um, that research suggested that the mTOR pathway was heavily involved and that mTOR pathway inhibitors, a class of drug, could therefore effectively be useful in managing tubular sclerosis. Now the researchers, rather than leaving it there, getting their papers and ticking it off, decided to try and take that further forward uh, to move it towards testing as, as a route to treat patients. Um, unfortunately, their initial approach for funding uh, of a full academic trial um, on the generic drug in an open label set, set uh, was rejected by the MRC. And again, that could have proved to be the, the, the barrier. Um, but the charity, Tubus Gross Association, got involved, helping to find, to provide some funding for this, along with governmental funding that met, let them do an open label phase two clinical trial study uh, in the kidney tumours. Now, this showed enough efficacy, enough effect in the open label study to get the interest of a big pharma company. And this is a company that had an, a, a labelled version of their drug, a drug that was still under patents called Everolimus. Uh, and they thought they could possibly use Everolimus and repurpose it into tubular sclerosis. So they decided to fund a large 
international phase three study of lots of different patients to see if everolimus could be beneficial in tuberous sclerosis. And this obviously really transformed the situation and allowed the, to move that drug towards the patients more quickly. Um, they were successful, and the reason the Vartis were probably so interested in doing this was because they could gain the benefits of the orphan drug designation for their existing drug. And that essentially allowed them to extend their market exclusivity, extend the period for which they were the only company making that drug far beyond its original patent life. So my research a while ago suggested that the exclusivity would have run until 2021, so next year, and the original patent expired in 2013. So you see a real business benefit for the Vartis here but also a real benefit and impact on the patients themselves. This drug is now approved for a number of different indications for intubus sclerosis. On label medicine, it's available in the UK, it's paid for by NICE and a number of other bodies. And, and the cost for an orphan drug isn't huge, 36,000 pounds per patient per year. Um, there are many much higher than that. But it's an interesting case where industry have clearly benefited and the patients benefited through that involvement. Um, a final example, which was something we had at our drug repurposing conference this year, uh, was the work that Interbio are doing uh, to repurpose a compound called n acetyl DLDC. Um, and this is interesting because it's one of those examples of innovation that I was talking about. Interbio have um, <coughs> decided to look at this compound through initial discussion with a residency patient group, Minimum Pig UK. But they've, they've identified that this drug could be beneficial to a number of different neurodegenerative conditions including pace sacs and a different type of ataxia as well as the kick. So this is a very small, agile uh, biotech company and what they've done is using the collaboration with patient groups, they've, they're gonna try and build multi, uh, a single master trial protocol for multiple different conditions and run in parallel different clinical trials, different conditions uh, that use that same protocol to try and get multiple approvals for this drug quickly. So that's really speeding up access for multiple different patients. Um, they've worked very, very closely with the patient groups in doing this, which I think is a really nice model to see. And it's given them a better sense of how to design the trial to work for patients, what is needed at the trial site to work for patients, and also helps to smooth the recruitment onto the trial, which is very rapid compared to what they might have expected. This engagement also helped them, th uh, help them think about the actual trial design. And, and in this case, um, what they really found was they were pushed to go for that kind of gold standard double blind SIBO controlled clinical trial in their drug repurposing program. But engagement with the patient community and the more they thought about it, they just felt they would never actually be able to recruit for the study in this scenario because the, the need, the impact on the patients is so severe. Um, so in that consultation with the patient input, they've been able to move forward with a completely different trial design, which is a more open label approach, which has washout periods for control to allow them to test the drug effectively and ensure they'll have effective recruitment onto the study itself. Uh, and again, this is quite an innovative way of, of moving trial design forward and something that in really small, ultra rare conditions is often necessary to move things to fruition and get them to patients. So it's something that I think is, is great to see in the rare disease drug repurposing space. So I'm gonna sum up. Um, Drug repurposing is transforming rare disease treatment discovery, in my opinion, and, and the number of drugs that are beginning to now reach patients, which is great to see. We've run a conference for five, six years now, where we're focusing on um, drug repurposing specifically, and we're seeing loads of different projects out there, loads of things happening, and more of them now are getting to that point that we're seeing with, that, with the AKU study, where they're beginning to move to the point of approval to reach patients, it's a very exciting time and, and hopefully it's gonna drive more and more repurposing down the line. Ap academic and patient-led collaborations are proving successful in this space uh, and there's lots of different approaches to this have been developed, whether you look at the MCDS type study or some of those more uh, industry-focused collaborative models that I just touched on. Um, and more broadly for this webinar as a whole, COVID-19 is, is raising the profile of repurposing. We are hearing it being talked about and highlighting its potential as a and meet that high on net need. Um, rare diseases really do have a high on net need uh, and they're seeing ever increasing levels of repurposing over time. And we, we really hope that rare disease patients can benefit from the increased public, scientific and political focus on repurposing and maybe down the line once we come out of this quite scary emergency and we, we have um, this, this pandemic more under control, we can see some kind of knock on benefit to um, the rare disease repurposing space to, to help those patients with that massive amount. 
uh, more effectively down the line. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and I will hand back to Phil, and we will take some of your questions. And apologies, we're running a little later than my uh, check. Okay, hello everyone again, and thanks Rick and David. So we've been getting some um, really good questions in, so I'm just gonna run through these. So firstly, as what does open label mean? Cool, yes, yeah, it's a really good question actually. Mm -hmm. um, normally in a, a clinical trial, we talk about blinding, and that means essentially that when you're on the trial, you don't know if you are accessing the drug or a placebo, so a, a sugar pill, for a better word, you know, it totally isn't clear. So in an open label study, everyone kind of knows what the drug is and where it's, where it's going to be treated. Is that a fair explanation, David? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> and um, from the point of view of robustness of data, uh, mm -hmm. It may give you a a um, subconscious uh, ex expectation of success if you think you're being treated with the active uh, mm -hmm. rather than, than the placebo. If you don't know, then obviously that subconscious subconscious element can't can't come to the fore. The other point is that in 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 blinding, it doesn't necessarily just mean the patient who is blinded. It also means yeah. the doctor who is blinded. So the doctor can't kind of impart a um uh some kind of some, something to the patient as to whether they think this treatment that, that the patient is getting might be beneficial or not thank you david thank you uh, what are the ongoing covid clinical trials in the uk i think the uh the ongoing ones are mainly focused around chloroquine and hydro hydroxychloroquine um there may be some others uh, for the use of remdesivir, which is the Gilead drug. Um, I don't know more detail than that. I think um, some of the government sponsored work is focused quite a lot on the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine because if successful, these things can be um, immediately given to patients without it much further uh, being done. Uh, remdesivir is something which is, I think, still proprietary to Gilead. Uh, mm -hmm. The work that we're doing with imatinib, incidentally, that's although that's not in the UK, it's in in Amsterdam, in in the Netherlands. Um, if the outcome from that is successful, then uh, doctors should be able to prescribe it uh, for the treatment of COVID. It won't necessarily be labelled for COVID, but mm -hmm. um, Imatinib is available in this country and doctors on their own recognizance should be able to prescribe it if the trial is successful. Thanks, David. Um, which endpoint do you use for the types of COVID-19 patients and how do you categorize the two types of patients considering that most of these patients are hospitalized at later stages? Right, so um, the difference between critical and severe ARDS patients is whether they are being treated in an ICU or they're outside the ICU. So we're all very familiar with what's happened to Boris Johnson. He was admitted to hospital about three days ago. Initially, he was just kept in the hospital. And then after a day, he was transferred to the intensive care unit. And most patients on the intensive care unit are intubated, which is they put a tube in your throat um, and your mechanically uh, your ventilation is, is mechanically assisted. So that would categorize a, a critical patient. Um, whereas if you're awake and you're conscious and you're able to take oral medication, then that would be a severe rather than critical. And um, what was the other question? Um, what are the endpoints do you use? That's a, that's a very good point. Um, the the endpoint in the oral study that we're conducting is the uh, extent to which patients are uh, ha have transited from the hospital into the ICU and are alive. Um, but there, there are some biomarkers that you can use. And 
one of the biomarkers that we're considering using for our intravenous study is based on the level of uh, water in the lungs or, or fluid in the lungs, extravascular lung water. And that's been correlated to mortality. So it's like a biomarker. It's a, it's a good way of assessing um, in, an early, in a pilot study the efficacy of a drug. Just on this, on this next slide, um, just compiled some useful resources for you um, in regards to um, what Finding Cure has done in the past with drug repurposing. So the first link will take you to our drug repurposing page on our website, and that covers things like social impact bonds and just um, things that are happening um, in the rare disease world to do with drug repurposing and what Finding Cure has done. The second link will take you to the drug repurposing and portal guide on our e-learning portal, which is our um, most up-to-date guide on there um, in the research area. So that's got some really useful videos and infographics on there to kind of take you through the basics if you want to step back step back in and have a look and and brush up on that knowledge and there's also some other guides coming and the portal will be getting updated soon so if you can keep an eye on that there should be some really useful resources coming to you in the next few um months and then the last link will take you to our um conference um our past conferences um so you can see all the summaries and the talks and the slides so thank you so much to david and to rick for sharing their knowledge on um, drug repurposing today and i hope this was really helpful for everyone here in the room to hear about today so thank you